Hello, I am Professor Sid Morris, the author of the online book Topology Without Tears, which can be found on the web at www.topologywithouttears.net. This is the second in a series of videos which supplement that online book. In video one, I explained that in pure mathematics, we start with a set of axioms and using logic, prove propositions and theorems, thereby developing a theory. If we are studying analysis or group theory or topology or vector space theory or indeed almost any area of pure mathematics, we often begin with the statement, let X be a set. So it is fair to ask, what properties of sets do we assume and do we use? This video is therefore about set theory and in particular the zermelo frankel axioms for set theory. Set theory is discussed in Appendix 1 of Topology Without Tears and the zermelo frankel axioms are mentioned in Appendix 6. But let us begin in a very gentle way with a fairy tale. Yes, a fairy tale. There was a town called Russell, which had a number of barbers or hairdressers. Some barbers cut their own hair and others did not. So the mayor of the town decided to appoint Bert, one of the very good barbers, to a special role. The mayor instructed that Bert was to cut the hair of those barbers who did not cut their own hair, but not to cut the hair of anyone else. Let's just repeat that. The mayor instructed that Bert was to cut the hair of those barbers who did not cut their own hair and not to cut the hair of anyone else. But Bert had a question. Should he cut his own hair or not? If Bert chose to cut his own hair, then he was a barber who cut his own hair and so he was not obeying the mayor's instruction that he cut the hair of only those barbers who did not cut their own hair. So Bert decided not to cut his own hair. But then Bert was a barber who did not cut his own hair. So Bert was not obeying the mayor's instruction that he should cut the hair of all barbers who did not cut their own hair. In summary, if Bert did not cut his own hair, then the mayor's instruction was that he should cut his own hair. And if Bert did cut his own hair, then the mayor's instruction was that he should not. So Bert realised that no matter what he did, he could not obey the mayor's instruction. Think that through yourself just to make sure you understand it. Now this is an amusing fairy tale, but in due course we shall see that it is very pertinent to our study of set theory and exposes a serious problem with our simple idea of what sets are. For hundreds of years, everyone believed that they knew what a set was. It was simply any collection of items, whether items might be numbers or objects or indeed anything. And sets are either finite or infinite. But in his 1874 article, in German, with translated title, On a Property of the Collection of Real Algebraic Numbers, the Russian-born and German-educated mathematician Georg Cantor challenged 
the very foundations of mathematics with his analysis of infinite sets and the introduction of transfinite arithmetic. His understanding of infinite sets was opposed very strongly by some of the most prominent mathematicians of the time. This opposition to his ideas continued for a couple of decades, but was largely put to rest by the beginning of the 20th century. Central to Cantor's approach was his notion of one-to-one -one correspondence to define when two sets are of the same size. So let us begin with finite sets. A set S is said to be finite if for some positive integer n there is a one-to-one -one function f which maps the set consisting of the numbers 1, 2, 3 up to n onto the set s. Recall that a function f is said to be 1 to 1 if f of x equals f of y implies x equals y. And f is onto means that the image under f of the set 1, 2, 3 up to n is all of s. Cantor called a 1 to 1 onto mapping between two sets a one-to-one -one correspondence. So a finite set is one which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a set one, two, three up to n for some positive integer n. If a set is not finite, then it is said to be infinite. This sounds very straightforward and has no surprises. But Georg Cantor asked, does there exist a one-to-one -one correspondence between every two infinite sets? After all, if all infinite sets are of the same size, namely infinite, then surely there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between any pair of them. So let us think about some examples. Let n denote the set of all natural numbers, that is, the set of positive integers. And let z be the set of all integers. By the way, note that I say z, because I'm an Australian, rather than z, which an American might say. So let z be the set of all integers. Can we find a one-to-one -one correspondence between the infinite sets n and z? Well, yes, we can. We can do it quite easily. We begin by listing the members of z as follows. 0, minus 1, plus 1 minus 2, plus 2, minus 3, plus 3, and so on. Then a one-to-one -one correspondence f between n and z is given by f of 1 is 0, the first in our list. f of 2 equals minus 1, the second in our list f of 3 equals plus 1, the third in our list. f of 4 equals minus 2, the fourth in our list. f of 5 equals plus 2. f of 6 equals minus 3. f of 7 equals plus 3, and so on. So even though z is obviously a bigger set than n, there is indeed a one-to-one -one correspondence between n and z.
So far, no surprises. Let P be the set of all prime numbers. That is 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, and so on. This set P of all prime numbers is a much smaller set than the set N of all natural numbers. Can we find a one-to-one -one correspondence between N and P? Well, yes. We define the mapping F between N and P by F of 1 equals 2, the first prime number. F of 2 equals 3, the second prime number. F of 3 equals 5, the third prime number. F of 4 equals 7, and so on. So again, no surprises. What if we take a set which seems much bigger than the set N of all natural numbers, namely the set Q of all rational numbers? While it is slightly more tricky, in Appendix 1 of Topology Without Tears, we do indeed find a one-to-one -one correspondence between N and Q. So maybe all infinite sets are indeed in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set N of all natural numbers. But Georg Cantor showed that this is not true. Indeed, we prove in Appendix 1 of topology without tears, that there does not exist a one-to-one -one correspondence between N and the set R of all real numbers. Quite simply, this says that there is more than one infinity. But Cantor also noted that if S is any non-empty set, and P of S denotes the power set of S, that is the set of all subsets of S, then there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between S and P of S. Let us consider the set N of all natural numbers. Then P of N the power set of N, i.e. the set of all subsets of N, has no one-to-one -one correspondence with N. Further, P of P of N, that is, the power set of the power set of N, has no one-to-one -one correspondence with N or P of N. And we can go on. The P of P of P of N, the power set of the power set of the power set of N, is not in one-to-one -one correspondence with any of the previously mentioned sets. Continuing in this way, we obtain an infinite number of infinite sets, no two of which are in one-to-one -one correspondence. In short, there are an infinite number of infinities. To the mathematicians of that time, this was truly mind-blowing. It was totally unexpected. Indeed, one of the most influential mathematicians of the time Leopold Kronecker publicly referred to Cantor as a scientific charlatan, a renegade, and a corrupter of you. 